Welcome to the STEM project question three. This is one of the three questions available to you. This question is about Alan Turing, codes, patterns and ciphers. During World War II, mathematician Alan Turing and other British scientists created a machine to decipher the Enigma code, used for communication within the German armed forces. It is claimed that cracking the code saved millions of lives and prevented a further two years of war. Create your own code, ensuring that there is a familiar pattern, rule or sequence, and write a series of messages using your code for others to decipher. This question is really in two parts. The first part is about the very famous British scientist Alan Turing and what he did during the war um, to save millions of lives and the history around that. And the second part of it is using your research, using the knowledge that you're going to gain during this project to make your own code or codes using patterns, rules, sequences, all of which you'll find out more about over the next few slides and making yourself some messages uh, for others to try and then decipher. In its purest form, mathematics is the search for truth. It's the solution to the problem. This year is a special year for me and other mathematicians like me, as it marks 100 years since the birth of Alan Turing, who possessed perhaps one of the greatest mathematical minds of the 20th century. Turing was a mathematician, cryptographer and pioneer of computer science, whose life was one of secret triumphs shadowed by public tragedy. Perhaps known today for his part in breaking the German Enigma code during World War II, Turing was by that time already established as a mathematician of extraordinary capability. Born on the 23rd of June 1912, Turing spent his childhood split between Hastings in Kent and Sherborne in Dorset. Displaying a precocious talent at school for maths and science, including condensing Einstein's theory of relativity for his mum at the age of 15. Turing's abilities led him to receiving a scholarship at King's College, Cambridge. He arrived here to study as an undergraduate in 1931. Like many great minds, Turing was never happier than when he had a problem to solve. And in keeping with the exceptional skill and ambition he had already displayed, he turned his attentions to the decision problem, or Entscheidungsproblem in German. Laid out by the legendary German mathematician David Hilbert at the turn of the century, the problem was one of the most important unsolved mathematical challenges for the 20th century. It was here in the spring of 1935, by the flow of the River Cam at Grantchester Meadows in Cambridge, that Turing decided to take on the giants of mathematics at the time. Turing conceived of a hypothetical machine that reads symbols on a strip of tape, rewriting or deleting them based on a finite set of rules. In fact, originally, Turing described a person slavishly performing these operations. He called this person the computer. Given a problem to compute, this machine would either stop and give you the answer, or run forever if the answer doesn't exist. Turing mathematically proved that you can never know if and when the machine will stop. He did this by creating the definitive example of the undecidable problem, an astounding feat that disproved Hilbert's question of decidability, showing that dark areas in mathematics will always remain a barrier to complete truth. The imagined Turing machine model went on to become one of the cornerstones of computer science and is arguably one of the most influential mathematical abstractions of the 20th century. And Turing was only 22. Returning to Cambridge following time at Princeton, Turing began working for the Government Code and Cipher School, the UK's code breakers. For many years before the Second World War, the German military had been using a cipher machine called Enigma to encrypt their secret messages. About the size of a typewriter, an Enigma machine has a second set of letters that light up, called the lampboard. If you press a letter on the keyboard, 
the machine generates a different letter to represent it on the lamp board, creating the code. The standard Enigma machine had over 150 million 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 possible daily settings. Inside an Enigma are three rotors, which turn after pressing a key, making the wires of the circuit rotate, thus changing the circuit completely. So pressing the same letter will generate a different result. Double letters, for example, may not become double letters in the code. Enigma posed a formidable challenge for the allied codebreakers. Codebreaking is a battle of mathematical wits and cunning, and during wartime, the stakes are high. Turing relished such challenges. A day after the UK declared war with Germany, he reported to Bletchley Park for work on breaking the German Enigma cipher. Turing's contribution to the codebreakers was quite simply vital to the war effort. Not only did he make the first breakthroughs with the naval Enigma code, allowing Britain's food and supplies to be shipped across the Atlantic, but along with Gordon Welchman, he designed a machine to smash the German Enigma code, called the Bomb, named for an earlier Polish code-breaking machine. By using the fact that the German codes often contained a common phrase, such as those found in weather reports, the codebreakers would try and guess a short phrase or crib that might appear in an Enigma message. They would input this guess into the bomb, designed to perform a sweep of the myriad ways in which an Enigma machine could have been set up. By using the principle of contradiction, combined with extraordinary mathematical insight, the codes were eroded and eventually cracked. On a good day, the bomb machine could find an Enigma setting in 15 minutes. In 1945, Turing received an OBE for services to the Foreign Office, though the real reason for this honour remained top secret for another 30 years, long past Turing's death. Today, historians believe that the work of the codebreakers shortened the war by two years, and in doing so, saved countless lives. Following the war, Turing went on to work at the University of Manchester and continued to make hugely significant contributions to computing and later biology, until his death in 1954. He is credited with laying the foundations for computer technology and artificial intelligence and worked on the first recognisable modern computers. In September 2009, 55 years after his death, the British government made a public apology to Alan Turing. Turing was gay at a time when it was illegal to be gay. On discovering the truth about his sexuality, the authorities forced Turing to endure horrific hormone treatment. He was labelled as a security risk and he lost his job as a codebreaker. In the end, Turing committed suicide by biting from an apple laced with cyanide. A desperately sad end to the life of a genius. Today, we live in a world dominated by computer technology. From cars to smartphones, desktops to rockets, life in the 21st century is almost unimaginable without computers. They facilitate our existence. For Alan Turing, hero of Bletchley Park and father of computer science, this was never the aim, or even the point. He cared about filling the gaps in our knowledge about finding the light, the truth, the solution to the problems.
This probably looks like gibberish to you, and it should, because it's a cryptogram, a message in code. But if I told you that all I did was shift every letter in the sentence to the next one in the alphabet, then you'd know that it translates to this. To encrypt a message, you need two main parts, the cipher and the key. The cipher is the set of rules that you're using to encode the information, for example, shifting the alphabet by a certain number of letters. The key tells you how to arrange those rules, otherwise they'd be the same every time and it would be easy to decode the message. In this case, the key would be one, because we shifted the alphabet by one letter. To decrypt the information, you need to know what kind of cipher was used, and also have the key. Or you can just crack the code, either by trying all possible combinations you can think of, or by analyzing the code and working backward from it, known as decipher. But, is it possible to come up with a combination of a cipher and key that could never be determined? Is there such a thing as an unbreakable code? Well, people keep coming up with new and better ciphers, but it's hard to make them unbreakable. Because no matter what, you're using a set of rules to encrypt the information. And with enough time and enough data, someone can usually uncover those rules. That puzzle I just gave you is one of the oldest and simplest ways to encrypt a message. It's usually called a Caesar cipher, and in this case, the key was just a number representing how many letters of the alphabet I shifted it. But it's also very easy to crack. Even if you didn't know the key, it would take you at most 25 tries to decode the message, because you know that the whole alphabet has to be shifted by a certain amount. Since there are 26 letters in the alphabet, there are only 25 other options. A Caesar cipher is one simple type of monoalphabetic cipher, a class of ciphers where the whole code is based on one letter of the alphabet standing in for another letter, consistently throughout the whole message. Basically, you just scramble the alphabet. In that case, the key would just be a list of which letters correspond to which, like this one. There are over 400 septillion possible possible ways to encrypt this kind of message, so you'd think it would be hard to crack. And it is. But only a little bit. Because there are lots of ways to decode messages. Just trying all of the possible keys to a code is probably the most obvious and least subtle, and it has an equally unsubtle name. Brute force. But you can try a more sophisticated technique, something called frequency analysis, which is based on the idea that every language has its own specific patterns. In English, for example, the letter E shows up a lot. I used it seven times in just the last sentence. And some words, like the, are so common that it's hard to even use a sentence without them. Cryptographers call these words cribs. So frequency analysis looks for common words and also common letters or sets of letters like ed or ing at the end of words. If you find that the letter x is showing up a lot in a message, and so is the three letter word I IRX, you might guess that in the key, X corresponds to the letter E, and IRX spells the. And once you've figured out those letters, you can figure out the rest by recognizing other words and using the process of elimination. And since longer cryptograms contain more clues, they're easier to crack. So monoalphabetic ciphers are fun, but they're not hard to break. If you want to get a little fancier with your encryption, you can use polyalphabetic ciphers instead. They're much more effective. In a polyalphabetic cipher, the way you scramble the alphabet actually changes throughout the message. In the first word, S might translate to W, but in the last word, S might translate to H. It all depends on the particular encryption method you're using, and on your key. One of the earliest polyalphabetic ciphers was the Visionier cipher. Developed in the 16th century, it was pretty simple because the key was just a word. So let's say you want to encrypt Encrypt SciShow is the greatest using a Visionaire cipher. Well, the first thing you need to do is write out a Visionaire square. The alphabet goes across the top and along the left side, and each row contains the letters A to Z shifted over by one. So the first line starts with A and ends with Z, but the second starts with B, goes all through the letters until Z, and then ends with A, and so on. You end up with 26 differently scrambled alphabets, and now you're ready to encode the message. You just have to pick a key. Let's just say your key is Michael. You write out your key multiple times until it fills the same number of letters as your message. So SciShow is the greatest would correspond to this. Then to encrypt it, you take each letter of the message and move along its row in the Visionaire square until you get to the column of the corresponding letter in Michael. So SciShow is the greatest turns into this. That's much tougher to decode unless you have the key because those letter frequencies are all different now. Since the keyword Michael is seven letters long, each letter of your message is encrypted using seven different scrambled alphabets. But if your text is long enough, it's still crackable using a type of frequency analysis developed in the 19th century by cryptographer Charles Babbage. Babbage realized that in a long enough message, some patterns in the coded message will still show up. Like if your key only has seven letters, that means that there are only seven ways to encrypt the word the. But if your message uses the word the eight times, there are definitely going to be repeats. So he just counted how many letters separated those repeated patterns. If they were separated by 7, 14, or 21 letters, he knew that the key was probably 7 letters long. And from there, he would just use frequency analysis to figure out the 7 scrambled alphabets. Babbage's method is just one example of why it's so hard to create an unbreakable cipher. Your key creates a pattern within the encrypted message, and with enough work, a spy can uncover that pattern. It turns out that the only way to have a really unbreakable cipher is to use what's known as a one-time padding 
encryption, which uses a key that is as long as the message itself. That way, there aren't any patterns in the encrypted text. There's nothing to analyze, so there's no way to work backwards. The sender and the recipient both have the same pad, and each sheet contains a long set of random letters, which is used as the key. Once a sheet is used to decode a message, you destroy it. Then you use the next sheet for the next message, so you never repeat a key. As long as you keep the pad safe, the message can't be decrypted by anyone else. But you can't always use one-time pad encryption. Let's say you needed to get a message to someone halfway across the world whom you'd never met you wouldn't have a chance to give them a matching pad. In warfare, that sort of situation comes up a lot, which is why in the early 20th century, there was suddenly plenty of incentive to come up with better ciphers. Remote communication, using technology like the telegraph, was incredibly valuable during wartime, but it was essential that only your allies understood what you were saying. The Germans experimented with a new, more complicated monoalphabetic cipher during World War I, but eventually, the French managed to crack it. Then, during World War II, the Germans again came up with a new cipher, and this time, its security seemed Perfect. Maybe you've heard of it. The Enigma machine. The machine used a polyalphabetic cipher that scrambled the alphabet in a different way each time you typed a new letter. As far as the Germans knew, the only way to decipher the message was to have your own Enigma machine and set it up using a secret key that changed every day. The machine was meant to work like a one-time pad in the sense that the alphabet was re-scrambled for every letter of the message. But instead of having to distribute a set of sheets to everyone, you could just use a key that told the users how to set up their Enigma machines, and you could change that key as often as you wanted. But it had a few flaws. For example, no letter could be encoded as itself. That might not sound like a big deal, but it ended up being a fatal weakness. British mathematician Alan Turing, along with the rest of his team, designed a machine of their own that could crack the Enigma code, as long as they knew around 20 of the characters contained in the message. Which they often did, because some phrases tended to show up a lot in Nazi communiques, especially nice things about Hitler. So part of the strategy of Turing's team was to look for cribs, those common words and phrases, and see where they might fit. For instance, if they knew a message contained the word Führer, they could look for places in the text that didn't have the letter F, since they knew that the F in Führer couldn't be encoded as itself. Those clues helped them figure out how the Enigma rotors were set up to encrypt the message. Cracking the Enigma code was a huge advantage for the Allies. Many historians attribute some of the most important victories during the war to information the Allies got from the Enigma encrypted messages. These days, encryption is mostly important in digital computing. And that isn't perfect either. When websites announce that hackers now know everything about you, that's because their encryption methods were breakable. Companies that store your data have to take into account a whole new set of considerations, like how when you can complete billions of operations per second, brute force suddenly becomes a lot more practical. So the same principles that Visionaire and Turing used are the same ones that allow you to pay your bills online and keep North Korea out of your email, most of the time. But how is a story for another episode. Thank you for watching this episode of SciShow, which was brought to you by our patrons on Patreon. If you want to help us keep making videos like this, check out patreon.com scishow, and don't forget to go to youtube.com scishow and subscribe. There are several different kinds of cipher and different ways to encode messages to make them unreadable. The first is a simple substitution cipher um, where you uh, change the letters to another letter and you move them along in the alphabet by a certain amount. Um, the second is where if you have a message that is a square number of letters like 25 or 16, you can arrange that into a grid a square grid and then write it out the opposite way uh, so you get gibberish but that can be uh, decoded back into its original message and then there's uh, ciphers that use um, poly alphabets so more than one alphabet to encode and these start to get more and more complicated and more towards the um, German Enigma machine which was very very difficult to um, decode which you've already learned about in some of these videos these are some of the types of codes, the types of ciphers you can use when you do create your own codes for others to try and decipher.
Cryptography is absolutely fantastic and really, really interesting. Um, have a look online when you start doing your research. Um, there's some fantastic things. I've picked out a couple of things here that you may want to look at. The first one is about careers in cryptography and what you could potentially do um, in the future around cryptography. And then the second one is about women in cryptography, um, a bit of history that uh, get, often gets overlooked but is very, very important. Use the links on screen now to read these articles. Here are a few websites you may want to look at when you are researching um, this question before you start putting together your answer and you'll see ways that you can put that together on the next slide. Just remember when you are doing your research, when you are doing all this work, that you are marked on the content, what's actually in there, the effort, the amount of time, the amount of effort you put into this task and how creative you can be around it. So there's lots to get your teeth stuck into in this project. There are loads of different ways you could present this project and answer this question. A great one would be a PowerPoint presentation because you could show the codes on the screen for people to decipher. You could also put in different slides after that on how you've actually made this cipher, what you've used to do that without giving the game away on the first slide so people can try and decode it. A project book would be a fantastic one as well so you can show your work that you've done. And a video presentation would also work really, really well for this particular question. Good luck. There's loads of different ways to present it. Be as creative as you can and get some fantastic codes out there. Okay, guys, just one final reminder of exactly what you need to be doing in this um, STEM project. Um, so question three, during World War II, Alan Turing, a fantastic British mathematician, he made a machine that could solve the Enigma code, uh, a code used by the Germans to transmit messages during the war. Um, it's claimed that it saved millions of lives, uh, Alan Turing cracking this code, and the war could have actually gone on for a further two years if he hadn't have done the work, along with lots of other people at Bletchley Park. Um, what we're asking you to do in this question is uh, do some research around Alan Turing, some research around what happened during the war, um, have a look at codes, ciphers, um, deciphering ciphers and how it all worked, and then create some of your own codes. Use your research to create your codes for others to have a go and crack, and also include things like how you came up with that pattern, why you chose that specific pattern as well. Remember that this um, project, this question is marked on content, effort, how much effort you're actually putting in and how creative you can be. Good luck. I hope you enjoy it. We have got some incredibly exciting summer homework projects planned for you guys. So there are two projects available for each year group, one under the heading of STEM and the other a year of seismic change. It's really important that you answer one question from each of these projects. When you go onto our website and have a look at some of these questions, you will find they are incredibly interesting and provide you with an opportunity to research and create some fantastic project ideas. You will be wondering how your projects will be marked. So in September, form tutors will mark each project based on the following criteria, effort, content and creativity. They will award a grade one to four in each category with one being outstanding. Just wanna give you a few top tips on how you can achieve an outstanding grading in each of these. It's really important that as part of your research, that you do for each of these projects that you show that you have gone above and beyond. Present your work in a creative and unique way to catch the attention of your audience and think about the content that you include within each project. It's really important that the content that you include answers the question that has been set to you. For every grade one you achieve, your name will be entered into a prize draw. There's a separate prize draw for each category, effort, content and creativity. And if you get a grade one in all three, you will be you will have the chance to enter a fourth prize draw. So to the best bit, then, how will you be rewarded? So for completing each project, you will receive 25 credits from your form tutor. So 25 credits for the STEM project and 25 credits for completing a year of seismic change project. So in total, by completing these two projects, you will be eligible for 50 credits come September. That is 
equivalent to a bronze certificate. In addition to the 50 credits, there's a fantastic opportunity here for you to win an Apple iPad. Now, there are four prize draws available to you, depending on the grading you secure on effort, content and creativity. If your form tutor awards you with a grade one for any of the three categories, your name will be entered into the prize draw for these. Additionally, if you achieve a grade one in effort, content and creativity, all three criteria, your name will be entered into a fourth prize draw as well, increasing your chances of winning a, um, an iPad. Both projects will be marked separately, therefore there is an opportunity here for your name to be entered eight different times. If you have any further questions, please do not hesitate to contact your academy by the info at email address. We are incredibly excited about these projects and cannot wait to see the work that you produce. And most importantly, we can't wait to welcome you back in September.